everybody has to sleep, but do you really know how sleep works? In this video, we are going to be talking about Sleep Science 101. If you're interested in learning more about sleep and mental health, then go ahead and subscribe to this channel. I'm Dr. Nishi Bhopal, and this channel is all about holistic science-based ways to optimize your sleep and your mental well-being. I'm board certified in sleep medicine, psychiatry, and integrative holistic medicine, and every video also contains a tip for healthcare providers. And before we jump in, if you are a physician or other health professional, I would like to invite you to grab my free sleep mini course for outpatient doctors. The link to the course is shown on the screen here and is available under this video. When this video comes out, it is going to be January 2022. So happy new year. And the new year is a great time to set some goals with regard to your health. And a big part of optimizing your health is improving your sleep because sleep is so fundamental to health and well-being. So I thought it would be the perfect time to talk about Sleep 101 and kind of go back to basics. And this is going to be the first in a four-part series on how sleep works. And if you're ready to go through a program to optimize your sleep this year, I'm happy to announce that my program, the Holistic Sleep Reset, is going to be opening in mid-January. So go ahead and sign up for the waitlist if you're interested in hearing more, and then I'll send you more information on what the program is all about and when it's open to registration. So you can sign up for the waitlist using the link under this video. Okay, so let's talk about Sleep 101. And there are basically four aspects of sleep science that you want to be aware of. The first is the circadian rhythm, also known as process C. The circadian rhythm is essentially your internal body clock, and it is primarily controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain. And your internal clock runs on approximately a 24 hour cycle. Circa means around and dia means day. So your circadian rhythm is approximately on the cycle of one day. A lot of people know that the circadian rhythm is involved in your sleep-wake cycle, but it's involved in so many other processes in the body as well, including your hunger patterns, your levels of alertness, your hormone secretion, your body temperature, your metabolism, and so many things, the list goes on. Circadian science is a really exciting area of research. Your circadian rhythm is governed primarily by three main cues. These three cues are exposure to light, your meal times, and your levels of physical activity. So if you are getting light exposure at the wrong times or at different times every day, if you're having your meals at different times every day, if you're getting physical activity at vastly different times every day, all of these things can throw your circadian rhythm out of whack. And there are two primary hormones that follow a circadian pattern that help to regulate your sleep-wake cycle. These are cortisol and melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that's secreted by the pineal gland, and you'll see that as the evening sets in, your melatonin levels start to go up, and then in the morning, your melatonin levels will go down, and it follows a rhythm according to your circadian cycle. So when there are misalignments with your circadian rhythm, it can cause certain sleep disorders. For example, there's a disorder called uh, delayed sleep phase syndrome, which is common in young adults, adolescence, it often starts in, in your teen years around puberty. And this is characterized by staying up too late and having an inability to fall asleep earlier, and then sleeping in in the morning and not being able to get up on time. So you'll see this classically in young adults or teens where they maybe aren't sleepy till 12, you know, midnight or 1 or 2 a.m., but then they can't get up before noon. This is called delayed sleep phase syndrome. On the flip side, there is a circadian misalignment called advanced sleep phase syndrome. And this is more commonly seen in older adults. And it's the reverse of what I just described. So with this disorder, people will fall asleep too early in the evening, uh, earlier than they would like to. So maybe 7, 8 p.m. And then they wake up too early in the morning. So maybe at like 4 a.m. And sometimes this gets misdiagnosed. Actually, both of these conditions are often misdiagnosed as insomnia when they're actually circadian rhythm misalignment. So that was the first process, process C. The second process to know about with sleep science is process S. Process S stands for your sleep drive. Your sleep drive is essentially the likelihood that you're going to fall asleep at a given time. And this is largely influenced by a neurotransmitter called adenosine. 
So adenosine is a byproduct of cellular metabolism. So the longer you stay awake, the more adenosine builds up. And the more that adenosine builds up, it makes you feel more sleepy. So as that adenosine builds up during the day, you start to feel more sleepy. And then whenever you get a period of sleep, whether it's a period of sleep overnight or during a nap, your brain washes out all of that adenosine. And then the cycle starts again. When you're awake, the adenosine starts to build up again. This is why it's not recommended to lounge around in bed or to take long naps during the day because you want that adenosine to build up so that you can actually feel sleepy at night and increase your sleep drive. So here's an interesting thing about adenosine. Caffeine, the caffeine molecule, is very similar in structure to the adenosine molecule. So caffeine is able to go and bind to adenosine receptors and block the effects of adenosine. So when you drink coffee, you're blocking adenosine from having an effect. However, that adenosine keeps building up in the background, even though the caffeine is blocking those receptors. So this is why when that caffeine wears off, you may feel an influx of sleepiness or fatigue or drowsiness because that adenosine is now rushing in and binding to those receptors. So this is why when be people become dependent on caffeine, they feel like they need more and more to feel awake and alert, especially if they're not getting enough sleep. So we talked about process C, which is your circadian rhythm that fluctuates throughout the day. And we just talked about process S, which is your sleep drive that increases as the day goes on, largely mediated by adenosine. So process C and process S interact with each other to help regulate your sleep-wake cycle and your levels of alertness. So here's what happens in the evening. As that adenosine builds up and your sleep drive increases, your process C, your circadian rhythm, actually kicks in in the evening and you get this little upsurge in your levels of alertness. And sleep researchers call this the wake maintenance zone. So this is why you might get a little bit of a second wind in the evening. So if you can start to get a grasp on these two processes, it's going to help you improve your sleep because sleep is not something you can force. You can't try to sleep or try to sedate yourself away into sleep. It's just not going to work very well with your natural physiology. Sleep is kind of like surfing. It's like trying to force a wave to come if you're surfing. That just doesn't work very well. If this type of information is helpful for you, go ahead and click the like button. The third aspect of sleep that I'd like to talk about is your nervous system and your mindset, starting with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Your sympathetic nervous system is the fight, flight, and freeze response. The parasympathetic nervous system is your rest and digest response. So can you guess which one is dominant during sleep? Your parasympathetic nervous system is dominant during most of your sleep because it is focused on the rest response. There are parts of your sleep like REM sleep where the sympathetic nervous system is more active. However, you need to be in a parasympathetic state in order to fall asleep and maintain sleep. But here's the problem. Most of us are stressed out all the time and we are in a chronically sympathetic dominated state. And if you're in this sympathetic dominant state, you're in a state of stress, it might lead into something called hyper arousal, which is basically where your nervous system is on overdrive. And then if you have trouble sleeping, you might start developing more anxiety and more stress and more fear even about sleep. You might start to think that you're just a bad sleeper, or you might start to feel a sense of anxiety when it comes to bedtime or even anxiety associated with your bed or your bedroom. This is why it's really important that you're regulating your stress levels during the day. So you're not in a chronic state of hyperarousal, so that you're not hypervigilant and anxious by the time that uh, bedtime comes around and that you're not feeling anxious about sleep itself. Because the more you try to sleep and the more you think about sleep, the harder it becomes. So you wanna make sure you're also addressing your negative thoughts about sleep or any negative associations you have about sleep. And this is where CBTI or cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is really effective. Even the fastest bullet train needs to slow down to get into the station. Your nervous system is like that. Even if you're revved up and you're anxious and you're busy or you're stressed out all day or you're super active, maybe you're not even stressed or anxious, but you're just really active all day, you need to give yourself some time to slow down so you can enter that sleep station in the evening. And then the fourth aspect that I wanna talk about with regard to sleep 101 is addressing root causes. So you might feel like 
I'm doing all the right things. I'm addressing my circadian rhythm. My nervous system is well regulated. I am not taking long naps during the day. I'm not using caffeine. My sleep drive is great, but I'm still not sleeping well. Then what do you do? This is when it's worth looking under the hood to see if there are any other root causes of poor sleep that need to be addressed. There are actually 80 different kinds of sleep disorders. These include things like sleep disordered breathing, which includes sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, and central sleep apnea. There are circadian rhythm disorders like we talked about, delayed sleep phase syndrome, advanced sleep phase syndrome, shift work disorder. There are various circadian issues to look at. There are also movement-related disorders like restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movement disorder, and the list goes on. So you wanna see if there are any other underlying sleep disorders that might be contributing to poor quality sleep. In addition to making sure there aren't any sleep disorders, you also wanna look at your gut health, your nutrition, making sure you don't have any micronutrient deficiencies or other nutritional issues that might be affecting your body's ability to function and your body's ability to sleep well. Certain medical issues can also affect sleep, like GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Irritable bowel syndrome is associated with poor quality sleep. Thyroid issues can also have an impact. Certain medications like beta blockers can reduce melatonin levels and affect your sleep. So you wanna make sure there aren't any medical issues that can be addressed. And then another really simple one is looking at your environment. I've seen simple changes like shifting into a better ventilated bedroom have a big impact on your ability to breathe at night and your ability to sleep well. So there are lots of factors to consider when looking at root causes. So here's your tip for healthcare professionals. If you ever see patients who struggle with sleep, go back to these four principles, circadian rhythm, sleep drive, nervous system and hyperarousal, and then identifying root causes. You can use that as part of your sleep assessment. And then sometimes simple psychoeducation can help. A lot of patients don't really understand how the circadian rhythm works or what the sleep drive is. And sometimes simply educating them on these aspects of sleep can go a long way in helping them to feel empowered, to take their health into their own hands and to feel empowered that they can actually improve their sleep. What was your biggest takeaway or your biggest aha moment from this video? Go ahead and let me know in the comments.